Okay, folks, uh, here we get to the next uh, lesson in this uh, series on uh, ML Commons and the A and uh, earthquake uh, benchmark. The earthquake benchmark is posed by me as an example of using artificial intelligence to advance scientific discovery. And of course, the ML Commons benchmarks aimed at improving scientific discovery. This is with some colleague of mine, John Rundle, I've worked with for over 20 years, and a student, Bo Feng, from Indiana University. The, we'll come back at the end of this, uh, in the last part, to, on this sort of a intro, comparison between the way, uh, say, I at least did things 10 years ago and before then. When you started there with laws of nature, you often built models, but these were not models based on neural nets. They were models based on physical intuition. Then what I did was called phenomenology. It was building models, motivated to, to compare with experiment, and they had various theoretical prejudices built in. Then we used either chi-squared or maximum likelihood to, to un see whether the theory agreed with nature. Now, in this so-called, that was theory-driven, because you really had to have the laws of nature sitting in there. Um, now we come to the AI-driven or the data-driven um, approach, where instead of the laws of nature, we start with AI. We use uh, nowadays dominantly deep learning, but in general, it's a mixture of machine learning and probability theory. And then that effectively gives a new model. So the model is always there, but the source of the model has changed from AI to laws of nature. And one reason this has become so popular is we just have more data than we did in the past. Okay, so this is a summary of this talk. I already told you why AI is an AI for science is important. And we view um, what we're describing here as an example of this. And we show how to generally use deep learning to describe a, a very important type of uh, experimental observable, a geospatial time series. That's a set of points as a function of time, which are labeled by ge geologically, by, by uh, the geolocation, the GPS location. We introduce a term which we call a spatial bag from several different applications. And uh, we focus dominantly on the earthquake case here. And as uh, already pointed out in part A of this series, this is going to become an MR Commons benchmark challenge. And it has three different implementations of a current neural net, science transformer, and a version of the Google temporal fusion transformer. And at the moment, they all give uh, comparable answers with uh, each of them having actually slightly different trade-offs and what they do well and not so well. All right, so here is a possibly foolish uh, concept. So we're going to try to compare more precisely these two approaches, theory-driven and data-driven. Well, when we were theory driven and watching apples fall. We, or we may, may be more precisely, Newton uh, sort of posed the answer as um, we, we have some values, which is the position of the apple on the tree. Then we cut the uh, uh, stalk, uh, holding it to the tree, and it falls to the ground. Then the new values, the uh, position of velocity of the apple, is given by a differential operator, Newton's uh, differential operator times the previous values. We'll do that. That stated qualitatively, it'll be done in a little more detail in the next slide or two. So when we have this equation here, uh, this differential operator is given to you by the theory. It's um, depends on various parameters like the mass of the apple and the gravitational force uh, g, well, force is m times g. And uh, we also have to do some numerics. So there we have applied mathematics tells us how to derive nifty differential difference equations. 
or possibly use spectral methods for your transforms to represent the operator numerically. In a data-driven approach, we still have exactly the same formulation, but it's no longer a differential operator, it's a deep learning operator. Here we have DL operator. And it is learned from is learned from data. But the this is this is commonly called inference. New values is the trained operator times the previous values. And this is a pretty complex operator, it's nonlinearly uh, a nonlinear operator. And it has various positive and negative features. It's much bigger than the, the theory, because the theory is so elegant. You can capture things very cleanly. So it's, theory is always very important, because it tells you how to generalize better. Whereas um, deep learning, you have to use transfer learning or something to generalize. Uh, and it's sort of elegant. It tells you what's really important. You know it's m and g, and x, zero, that's what counts. However, it has various properties. We'll see. It can allow much larger time steps, and it can um, possibly learn. It can learn the value of m and g and things like that. So this O here replaces Newton's law here, and it's the data-driven theory, the Newton's law of the future. Curiously, when you were, I was a child, I was told never to use high-order approximations in any in any numerical problem. You should always use low-order approximations, they were much more robust and less sensitive to noise. But deep neural nets are exactly the opposite. They're very robust and they're very verbose. They have lots and lots and lots of parameters. They're effectively very high order. Namely, in this earthquake case, we get up to 8 million parameters. Whereas Newton's laws, so at least for ODEs, only have uh, two to four parameters. So let's just give an example of, of, of uh, we'll pose this for time series. So if we will have our apple falling, we, ha we know uh, Newton's law says the mass times the acceleration of the apple is equal to the force. The force is mass times g, independent of time. And then we we, write, we take this equation here and solve it numerically with these uh, difference equations here. Where delta t has to be pretty small, because we've dropped the second order terms, or if we choose a slightly fancier form, we can just drop third order terms. Um, and this uh, standard theory does produce a time series. Namely, we have x of zero, x of t plus x of zero plus delta t, x of zero plus two delta t, and the same for velocity and acceleration. And it's initialized by value of t equals naught. And um, now, if we uh, when we do our data-driven case, we're assuming we still have a time series. But we already have some initial measurements of that time series. You know, we've been sitting there for a few millennia watching apples drop and storing the values of the x as a function of time. So before we go into that in a little more detail, note that we have, a, we have to um, learn some lessons from Newton's law. In Newton's law, there are going to be parameters, which is mass and g for the simplest law. Um, when we look at um, earthquakes, we'll have uh, we'll, we can obviously expect it to be de dependent on uh, positions, possibly, or um, fault positions. It can depend on all sorts of things. And if we did say a time series of COVID observables, which you'll see from John Hopkins or even the University of Virginia BII as a function of every day. Uh, that operator for New York City is going to be different from that for Charlottesville, because uh, probably uh, different cities, different cities or different counties have uh, different uh, different vaccination rates and different numbers of uh, senior citizens and so on. Also, the initial conditions are very different. And remember, initial conditions are important because look at this equation here. It clearly, depends on the initial conditions. Okay, so here is just one 
slide on uh, sort of a, something which really shows the relationship between Newton's law and deep learning. It's done with the, my colleagues uh, at uh, Indiana University. And um, here we just actually took Newton's, we took Newton's law itself, and instead of observing the position of 16 particles as a function of time with our eye and some flash photography or something, we just calculated it by solving with a tiny time step Newton's laws for the motion in time with a Leonard Jones potential of these particles. And if you, the uh, things on the, uh, the right are L the neural net, LSTM, and things on the left are the molecular dynamic simulation. Sorry, I had to wait for that uh, hint to come up. And then we find sort of an interesting result that uh, we can learn, and then we can then we can take different initial conditions and integrate these particles reliably in time and reproduce the results of the Leonard Jones potential. Interesting, the Leonard Jones potential only works with a time step of 0.001. Uh, if you make it bigger, as shown here, um, 0.01, which is here, and um, Point one, which is here, where the error goes up to 10 to the 23. Um, then here, then you go here. The error for point oh one, it goes up to 10, which is a catastrophe, of course. But for the recurrent neural net, the errors are always around 10 to the minus five, up to a time step of four. It's 4,000 times the, the time step of the um, Newton's law solved by the classic differential equation, difference equations. Uh, and this has 65,000 parameters. It was trained on 5,000 runs of Newton's laws. And the speed up is 30,000 on 16 particles interacting with these potentials. So now we've given that rather good example of the comparison between Newton's law and deep learning. Uh, let's look at the uh, general situation. We're going to study a type of time series which I call spatial bags. I call them bags because they're not particularly sensitive to the, um, they are geospatial. So these are time series which are at different space points, but they're not particularly sensitive to the exact value of that space point. And all they need to know is that each space point has a different time series. And then there's some um, possibly additional, comp possibly sophisticated information relating different space points. The space points could only, could be just differentiated, like supposing, well, let's take an example of uh, 300 apples. So we'll have 300 apples at different space points on 300 apple trees at different in different orchards, and then we watch them drop. So that could be an example where we see here the exact doesn't really matter what the um, space point is, because uh, the value of um, g is the same, but the value of mass might be different between the apples and certainly initial conditions, the height of the tree and things like that, and could also be different. So in these time series here, we have not, we have different, we have importantly uh, different time series, but they're not closely related in a way that we have to look at nearest neighbors and things like that. There are other time series where you need to worry about the geometrical uh, closeness of data. And in earthquakes, there is some issue with geometrical closeness, but it's not a strong constraint. Um, then we have, these are, the, these are the, these blue dots are the time points, and then we have two problems we're trying to solve. Forecasting the future, and what's called sec to sec, or sequence to sequence. And um, in the, this all, these all come from natural language processing, where the space points are different paragraphs or different books. There are the time series at each uh, space point is a few sentences, a nifty remark. And uh, what you want to do is one of two things. You want to map this uh, thing from uh, its audio representation to its text representation. You want to map it from English to French. Um, on the, but there is another problem, which is actually what we want for earthquakes, which is forecasting the future. 
Well, and you sort of see that actually in natural language processing. When you're typing your emails these days, the email uh, client actually often suggests what you're going to type in the future, and actually sometimes does quite well. So um, we're interested in this particular discussion and forecasting the future from these um, observed values in the past. And in the case of the Apple, that would say we have the apple at time t, we want to forecast its position at t plus delta t. Okay. Spatial bags. So here is the um, earthquake part that I introduced. Uh, we have here the region of space we're looking at. It's uh, from minus 120 to minus 114 in longitude. This is Southern California. Los Angeles, this is the Pacific Ocean here. Here is the desert out here. And here is Los Angeles with lots of earthquakes in the middle. And it's 32 to 36 in latitude. We divide this into little bins, which are 0.1 by 0.1 degrees in latitude and longitude. So given that we are four degrees in latitude and six degrees in longitude, that is 40 by 60, 2400 total little spatial bins, each is roughly 11 kilometers on the side, which is a sort of a natural sized uh, clump uh, earthquake uh, together. Uh, this particular uh, slide has the data uh, for different earthquake magnitudes. Here is the order data, magnitude greater than zero here, which is 450,000 or 404, over 440,000 uh, data points. Here is uh, Magnitude greater than 2.5, greater than 3.5, and far fewer, fortunately, greater than 4.5. Uh, one choice one has to make is what do you make a cut on this data? And now I we don't in the analyses reported here. I'm I'm willing to guess that if we made a cut on the data, we'd get better answers. Uh, it actually has some advantage in making a cut on the data we realize when looking at other regions. Only in Southern California is the small earthquake data recorded at all reliably. Well, in other parts of the said, but in places like Indonesia and, uh, and uh, New Zealand and Haiti, they're not recorded nearly as well. Here is a little comment on um, earthquakes and um, deep learning. Namely, there are two tasks, computational tasks related to earthquakes. One is sometimes called earthquake science, that's predicting the earthquake, that's what we're doing. Another is, given an earthquake occurs, we've just, uh, we've just been hit in Southern California, the building starts, uh, starts uh, bouncing around. Now we can predict that, that we can do a computation which uh, takes a given earthquake and asks, what will happen to buildings? That's because we know enough data we know enough about the structure of Los Angeles to be able to propagate the waves through the, the basin. We know enough about buildings, uh, hopefully that they're built properly to know what will happen when you, when you um, move the earth underneath them. So this is very difficult, earthquake engineering, but it's something which is feasible to run as a simulation on a large supercomputer. However, this first one is uh, can be run on a large supercomputer, but it'll, it's very difficult to produce reliable predictions because it depends on data we don't know. We, when we have an earthquake, these faults are rubbing against each other, and um, we just don't know how they rub. What is the friction law? Where do they? Where do they? Where are they most in contact? And, so, and further. Uh, typically, an earthquake is not a sort of deterministic event. It is a phase transition in the, in the physics language. And so we know phase transitions are incredibly sensitive to um, uh, tiny changes in the input data. I mean, even history, I mean, Japan became, did really well with a computer called the Earth Simulator. But, and it was originally built to actually predict earthquakes. Well, at least that was a major task it was meant to do. However, well, actually the technology to, to um, predict earthquakes was greatly improved by this computer, and the computer did lots of other important things well, but it didn't, do, it didn't really help earthquake forecasting so much.
Another way we can phrase this, which is sort of more AI oriented, is there's lots of hidden variables in earthquake forecasting. And so when we use deep learning to try to understand earthquake forecasting, we're thinking that there are the we don't know enough to write equations, but maybe those equations always give patterns. Maybe when there's an earthquake, maybe something always happens just before the earthquake, or maybe two years before the earthquake. And we can learn those patterns, so we can learn the hidden variables, or what the hidden variables do. And we use this learning of the patterns, or sometimes called pattern informatics, to understand earthquakes. This same type of ideas are present in the stock market, there's something called technical analysis, which is built around the same idea, that certain patterns, head and shoulders is one I remember, which give certain predictions in some people's eyes for what the stocks will do. So you can look, and there's, um, it's also worth noticing that um, you can lose all sorts of things in patterns. I mean, there are people, who, there are people in the past at least have said that dogs barking is a, or, or water gurgling through faults is a, is a are also a harbingers of earthquakes and can be used to. Uh, in some predictions. So those are just more sophisticated patterns, which we want to use a fancy word, they're multimodal. Modal. Water, water running and dogs barking are just different modes from the seismic activity that actually we're going to use. Okay, so we can summarize things here uh, about this, what we've learned on this, just setting up the earthquake problem on about data driven and theory driven. Um, to do the simulations, we need these huge supercomputers. The data-driven methods suddenly need big data, and because there's lots and lots of data problems, we're going to need lots and lots of computing. But we don't need necessary to run quite so many, uh, quite so many larger parallelism with such a big, such big jobs. They're big, but not, but maybe because we're searching over hyperparameters, and not because a, every one job is huge. Now the theory-driven approach um, has lots of successes. It's very elegant. Once you understand something theoretically, you really have much more confidence about knowing what's going to happen. But as we saw in this case, there are some failures. Maybe we just can't even derive the theory. Um, in our case here of uh, earthquakes, it's sort of an incomplete model of nature because we can't pr practically parameterize the missing aspects of the theory. It's just too many unknown, too many hidden variables, where those variables are, well, they're macroscopically, they're the friction laws, but uh, uh, microscopically, we just don't have the boundary conditions for the faults rubbing against each other. So the data-driven method is um, pretty exciting. It has uh, several successes already, and we, we showed, well, that trivial example, not trivial, simple example of Newton's laws was one, but there are many, many others much deeper and more important successes than that. Um, but as, as we're just starting to use AI in science, we're not quite certain where it works and how it works. And we also saw an important issue that is harder to generalize than the theory-driven method. The theory-driven method is clear how to generalized because we have a law which is clean and elegant and we can actually even think about that law and derive properties of of systems controlled by those laws independent of even simulating just by thinking so there's lots of ex good features by th of theory however i do think that this unfortunately it's probably going to be true that the theory driven will go down in importance so that's why I put a little shaded RIP across the theory-driven approach. Because the data-driven approach has had so many compelling successes, and it's in some sense easier to see how to apply it to a general problem than the theory-driven approach. Theory-driven approach, uh, uh, well, we can't have an Einstein or, or equivalent every day to just solve all our problems for us. Okay, so that's. Uh, that's our summary of the situation here as far as AI for science is concerned.